So let's start. So my name is Miro. I uh, I work with Ludger already for like six years almost, I think. Uh, I'm almost uh, in the finishing of my PhD now. And in principle, by, uh, by training or by my interest, I'm an architect. So I did like uh, a standard education as an architect. I, I worked in an office for a few years. So I did a lot of projects. And what I think, for me, what was always interesting with doing architectural projects is that each project, in a way, is a kind of a telling, telling of an interesting story. So this is something which, which I liked a lot. And then when I, when I joined ETH with uh, Ludger at the CAD, and then MIS, so it's a kind of a master of advanced studies, what I really liked was the way how we started to deal with concepts. So we started to play with concepts, and in principle we started telling a lot of interesting stories. So this is something that kind of turns me on how to tell stories around architecture. So I think in principle what brings us together at the chair for CAD and we also work in a close collaboration with the chair in Vienna is a kind of an interest in the digital. So in information, in big data, in coding, in all these phenomena. But to, to think how are they changing the way we, we think and how we relate to the world. Because I think what's interesting today is that we live in a world in, in which in principle everyone and everything is in a way connected. And we all have a kind of an, an access to, to a lot of information, yeah? to a lot of things around. And I think all of these stories, in principle, you should be kind of familiar because th this is, a, I think, what Ludger was, in, was, was telling to you. So when we have this kind of connectivity, then anyone can tell a story. And all these stories can make sense. So how, how do we tell stories or how do we talk about things that we really care for if we have the connectivity to read all the books, to have access to all the texts, to see all the images, to, to look at all the movies, and so on. And all these stories that, that we want to tell always kind of make sense because if we have enough of information, if we have enough of, of data, then we can kind of squeeze it, we can trim it, we can play with it, morph it, mirror it, what, whatever you want to do. And instead of telling us what the world is about, we can tell actually a story that we would like to, to tell. And I think this is a very interesting phenomenon, that this data and information then don't reflect the world as it is, but they, in principle, reflect the way how we think about the world. And this is a kind of a, a very interesting, almost a paradoxical situation. So how do I write if I have access to all the books? How do I take pictures if all the pictures are around me? And one way of addressing these problems, and I think this is what, what we kind of cherish very much at the chair, is to think of this as a kind of a literacy. A kind of a literacy that can help us to deal with a lot. So this is something that I want to talk about today. Uh, how do I, as an architect, talk about architecture when I have access to all of this? And here I would like to introduce you to, to Alice. So she comes from the plenty. She comes from the, she comes from the Wonderland. Yeah? So she's a kind of a bot. She's an avatar. She's a mutant. She's me as well, but she's not me. So we have a kind of a very interesting relationship. So she's independent and she is dependent on me. So she will, at the end of the story, you will see how she's tweeting. So she has a Twitter account and she's tweeting. And I think what's interesting about this story is to, to realize that Alice is not this kind of full automation. Yeah? So, it's, so it's a kind of an artificial intelligence, but it's also part of my intelligence. So it's, it's not autonomous, but it is in a way autonomous, but it's also kind of related to me. I think when we talk about artificial intelligence or machine intelligence and these kind of topics, it's in my understanding, very important to, to realize. So, for instance, that Alice is a kind of a renderer, more a renderer of certain panoramas. How would we call them panoramas? So, certain ways of looking, looking at the world. 
So today I want to tell you the story about Alice and how she deals with a lot, how she works with a lot, how she works with different, with different xenotecas, and xenotecas would be my personal libraries, how I look at the world, and then how she brings these different libraries together in a, in a, in a way to, to express herself or in a way to express certain interests, certain interests of, of mine. So I will try to give her uh, a voice. Yeah? And I will try to do it in a way that we play with, we play with kind of images and pixels, we play with objects, in this case chairs and voxels, and we play with texts and atom letters, and, we, and then Alice will try to, to kind of bring them together in, in a relatively, I hope, in a relatively consistent way. So what, what is common to, to all three of those approaches is that in all of them Alice wants to work with a lot. And here is the sense how she wants to work with a lot. What is interesting with a lot, I think it always is contained in the etymology of the word. word. So I think this is super, super interesting. So what is a lot? So a lot is an object used to determine someone's share. Anything from a dice to straw, but often a chip of wood with a name inscribed on it. So what's interesting here is that a lot is a way of an encoding something. So if we want to translate or give it a kind of a contemporary context. So it's a way to encode an object. Then later, what is a lot? So this encoding that we have, we put it, we place it in a hat or a helmet with other chips. We have this kind of an encoding. And then we take this helmet, we shake the helmet, and what we get then is a lot. Uh, a lot, or we can call it that which is given by fa fate, God, or destiny. So first we encode something, then we play lotto. If we want to translate then this again, we can say it's a kind of a game of probabilities. We play with probabilities in a way. And then the third interesting meaning of a lot is the group or a collection, uh, or how it's called the great man. We also call it the big plenty, the abundance, and so on. And this is the, the manner in which I want Alice to play with a lot. So that she takes objects, she encodes them, then she kind of does a probability game with them and creates certain characters. And while doing this, of course, she's always dealing with a great many. So in this sense, how Alice deals with a lot, I think the story she's telling and the story that I'm telling is not scientific or artistic per se. So I would say it's architectural in its gesture of always bringing the scientific tra tradition and the artistic tradition together and kind of mixing them. And it's as well architectural in, in another sense. So etymology of the world archi word architecture as well means weaving things together. So it kind of brings different elements together. So this is something as well what Alice should, should be doing. And what, what is interesting with bringing a lot of elements, I think the world was always full, full of many things, of many objects, but what is, uh, uh, let's say, kind of special today is that these objects are connected. Yeah? So the connectivity of objects is something which is very interesting. And what Alice wants to do, she wants to articulate constellations with an ever-increasing amount of parts. So these objects can belong to different constellations, and then how do we start playing with them. So how do we deal with a lot, with the big plenty and this connectivity? And how do we do it if we are architects? And now the question is like, why would, why would this be interesting? So here I would try to give you a kind of an ambient, why would this be interesting? And I would say this is interesting because a lot of friends from Alice, they come from this place. Huh? they come from this direction. So these are the aliens, the mutants, the Mayans, the avatars, the cyborgs. And then we can say, okay, they are not mortal, they are not immortal, they are not from heaven, they are not from earth. It's a kind of a, a funny statement. But I would say they inhabit a space of, of information, the space of abundance. And if we want to think about 
what they are or what they might be about. So we, we can think of what kind of objects are they using, how are they using these objects, what are they doing with them, what kind of literacy they have, what kind of nature do they have, is their nature similar to ours or not. But the more we try to focus and see what they are about, the harder we see. So we cannot get them. And why we cannot get them? Because I think they are always in mixtures, so they are never pure. They are mixtures of different kind of creatures, of different worlds, of different media, of different concepts, and so on. But this is what makes them interesting, that they are always mixed. So the, the harder we want to grasp them, the faster they go away. Nevertheless, we cannot label them in an easy way. Eh? We cannot kind of put them in boxes and categorize them. They are more, more in a kind of a, a setup of clouds and, and crystals. So we can say that they live on the Google planet, that they live on internet, that they hang out with, with other avatars and with, our, with other aliens. So social media could be, could be they, the way how they transport, how they express, or, or how they render their, their faces. Branding would be rather a, a way how they express their faces. They have their own currency, Bitcoin can be their own currency, and so on. And I think they like internet very much. Huh? So they like the web, they like the information. So maybe in a way we can say that they are information. So however we look at them, if they are actual or virtual, they, they influence our world. Yeah? So they give, us, they give us many faces, they give us the ability to have many different avatars and to play with them. And in, 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 in this sense, Alice, so this is Alice from Tim Barton. So she's very similar to, to my eyes. Yeah? So since I'm, I'm kind of in love with these kind of characters, I was thinking at one point, okay, I would like to design a chair for Alice. Yeah? So what kind, of, what kind of chair would Alice like? So it's a kind of an interesting question to see what kind of chairs these, these creatures use. And then I was thinking, okay, this chair should be a chair which is in between different worlds. This one is in Tim Barton's movie, and then this one is in my living room. Yeah? The first one is out of silver, the second one is out of gold. And this is of course not the real silver or, or the real gold, it's a kind of a, a, a coating, so it's, it's the way how we set up our renderer, how we want to, how we want to have it. And of course the, the form of, of chairs that Alice likes is not fixed. Yeah? So that it can have many different forms. So this one, for instance, is uh, is very small. Yeah? So you cannot even see it. You have to have an electronic microscope to see it. So the form and the resolution is not fixed. Or this one is, on the other hand, very big. It's in, in the museum, in the Vitra Design Museum. Yeah? But it's a little bit too too big. Or we can put these kind of chairs in drawings. So I think these chairs and avatars, they all live on the Google planet. Yeah? So they are both in a way informational objects and because of this, because they are informational, we can compute them in many different ways and we can play with them. They can have in a way many different faces. And what's interesting about those kind of chairs is that we are in a way living a, a classical way of of designing. Yeah? So we are not interested anymore in, in details of design, but what we are interested in is, an, in is a kind of a context. Of course, this is just one way how to approach it. Yeah? There are many different ways. I'm not saying this, this is how it should be, but it's a kind of a fantasy around, around these stories. So then we just take a lot of chairs. We take a lot of chairs and we use them as a kind of a base for for the alien chairs that we are doing. So not like a base, but we can also say like a database for, for these chairs. And then we end up in a kind of a, in a kind of a probability space on the Google planet. And the question is what, what do we want to render and how do we want to render it out of those of, of this probability space?
So when we are designing this, or when we are playing with these kind of chairs, we don't have to say, okay, what is the height of the seat? What is the angle of the, of the, of the, of the back? How, how many legs does it have? What is the material? We can play with all these things. We can impose the material later. And it's a kind of, a, in a way, a logistical play of many, many different elements. Of course, the question is how do we, how do we give them a certain character? But what is interesting as well with this is that all these objects are just one click away from another kind of reality. So we can say, I, I, I look at this one and this one and so on. But I would say, okay, this one I like, this one I like a lot. Huh? And then I just click and then it appears in my kitchen. Huh? And then funny things can happen with it. So for instance, as this plant is kind of decaying, this chair is decaying as well, yeah? but of course it's not, it's not related. Yeah? This chair is not mimicking the, the plant. It's a kind of coincidence, but it's interesting that, that you are able to, to, for instance, capture the notion of decay or the notion of time or whatever. How, now it's the question of how do you want to articulate the story of what's, of what's, what's going on here. So I think, I think when we are dealing with information, it's important to, to emphasize that the context and the stories around are crucial when we start playing with these games. Because stories, in a way, they empower objects, and I think our objects, they, in a way, grow better if we tell stories. Huh? So stories, in a way, articulate what we call real. And I think exactly with information technologies, with avatars and with this storytelling, we can in a way try to think what are computational objects and especially if we want to, to think about them when we, are dealing, when we are dealing with a lot. So this was a kind of an ambient to see where Alice is coming from and you got a, a, a feeling of what kind of chairs Alice likes. Huh? But what Alex, Alice really likes, what her passion is, architecture. So what's happening with with architecture. Of course, a lot is happening. So if we look at architecture in terms of, for instance, images, in terms of architectural blocks, what we see is this kind of, we can call it like a generic plane, an entropic generic plane, in which there is a lot. Yeah? So you have all these kind of different buildings, beautiful buildings, you have beautiful objects, you have beautiful drawings, you have famous architects and then and then these architects tell different stories and you have different theories about those stories and then these stories are published in online blogs and in different books and then while publishing them in different online blo blogs and books you have kind of different schools of thought around them you have different schools trying to claim different territories and then, of course, this is happening in cities, and these cities are sometimes smart, sometimes they're stupid, sometimes they're sustainable, sometimes they are green, and so on. But they're as well beautiful and challenging, of course. So how do we, how do we navigate? How do we surf in this kind of, we can call it a vertical? How do we deal with all this media and information? And I think, Interestingly, we can always try to think, okay, but how are the prominent people doing it? So how are the famous architects doing it? What are the faces of their architectural brands? What are their strategies? And then it's interesting to see, of course, that it's not all so new. Huh? So we, we have uh, Mies who was saying less is more, and then we have all these kind of very famous people who are saying less is a bore, I'm a whore, more and more and more is more, yes is more. And what is interesting here is that all of them are directly addressing a lot. So they don't call it a lot, they call it more, yeah? but they directly address this kind, of, this kind of problem. And how do we step out of, of this so not to add just another parole or think how to make another parole? But how do we take the way how they are working with it and start playing with them in a way? So how can we scan this, what we've seen here? How can we take it and start 
playing with it without judging it in a way. And of course, not only architects are dealing with it, but who is kind of showing an impressive way how to work with the lot are exactly avatars. So creatures like, like Alice or different kind of bots, Google, cryptocurrency, social media. So they're very kind of comfortable in this setup. So here is my fantasy. So I want to play with information, store, deal, emit and receive as Sarah would say it. So I want to look at the plenty of images and I want to look at the plenty of texts and be informed what they are about, but without reading the books and without looking at the images. So this is a kind of an interesting uh, setup. Of course, because not because I don't like reading or I don't look, like looking at the books, but because it's just too many. Huh? There are too many of books and too many of images if I want to look each one in detail. So I have to find a, a strategy how to address that, how to find the ones that I like to read, and how to find the, the images that I like to look. So how do I find consistency in the plenty, form different libraries, in the, inside of these different libraries try to find different atmospheres, and then bring them together in the character of, of Alice. So then here again I have two, two kind of steps. Two kind of steps which also come in a way from, from the, the etymology of the word a lot. So first step would be the encoding step and the second step would be the articulating step. An articulating step is the play of probabilities. So let's try to see, let's try to see how, how this might be. Yeah? Let's start with encoding of the images. So what could this be? So I call it an encoding of the weather or playing with the clouds. So if, if I want to, to play with the clouds, and clouds here I call the Zen, the Zen and our daily, I call them clouds, because they are informational objects, they are on the internet, so they are kind of informational clouds. So then we can ask the question, what would be the weather like in architecture? Of course, it would be much more beautiful if we had like 10 of them, huh? so if we had also design boom, if we had in habitat, if we had whichever you like, other blog here. Because I think with the information, the, the fantasy and the beauty comes from these different characters and from the way how they mix. But at this point, I have only these two. I can still play and try to look at them in different ways. So let's try to take this as two informational clouds, two, two kind of atmospheres, two weathers, and start, in a way, playing, playing with them. And if we look, this is kind of funny, if we look, for instance, in 2008, the amount of images which our daily was uh, publishing per year, or in 2008, they published around 3,500. And in 2018, they published 35,000, or more than 35,000. Yeah? So this is just from our daily, around 100 or even more than 100 images per day. So if you take 100 images or more than 100 images of our daily, another 100 from the Zen, then you take your Instagram and so on. So you get uh, like more than two, three, or in, in principle, an infinite amount of images per day that, that you can look. And it's gonna just get more and more. So how do we scan, collect, index, curate, maybe at measure? How do we start playing with these kind of things? Or to put it in different way, how do we behave how do we behave in a cloud? So can, can we think of digital weather as a kind of, as a part of a kind of a literacy, of a literacy that would be in the quantum city on an informational planet with a new kind of citizens? And is, for instance, Alice one of those citizens? So can we think of, of internet as a kind of a new kind of a public space or a kind of a a digital agora. The interesting thing about, if we think of it as, a, as, as this, is that there is no, the, there is no 
established way how we should behave. Yeah? So we, in a way, have to find out how to behave. And I think how do we behave in this kind of a public space is very much related to, to the idea of literacy. So to, to become a citizen, citizen of, of this digital space has a lot to do how do you become literate in this kind of an environment. And I think Alice is there. Huh? So if we want to start playing with the clouds, we have to think how to, how to transform these clouds in a way into numbers. How do we encode these clouds? How do we start playing with them in a certain way? So what would be a unit of a cloud or what would be a measure of a cloud? What would be a unit of the zine? What would be a measure of the zine? What is for me very, very interesting here is that there is no right or wrong answer to that. Huh? So what is the measure of the zine? Nobody knows. Huh? Or, and here the, the idea or the concept of encoding is very, very beautiful because I think it relaxes this exactly. It says, okay, there is no right or wrong way of doing this, but we can encode objects in different ways, depending how we like it, how we think about them, and then how they behave, we can test and we can start playing with them. So, let's try to take a walk in the cloud, let's start playing with this. And this is very funny that, that this kind of digital weather, although it's maybe not directly intuitive, but this is, I think, what we try to cherish, it's not only reserved for big actors like Google, Facebook, Amazon and so on, but in principle anyone is welcome. So there are many clouds and different weather and we can access them in, in, in different ways. And to access them, you need to write a small poem, you need to write a piece of code, you need to write, Ludger calls it a parser, however you want. I like this term poem very much. And this is a small poem that goes directly now to our daily. It checks, okay, what's, what's new on our daily? These are the links of our daily. And now let's take, for instance, images from the, from the first article. Yeah, this, this is what is in the first article on our daily. And if we go now to our daily, and if we check, this is the first article, yeah, and this is, these are the images. And now you can imagine how it, how it goes. Now we say, okay, let's go to the second article. We get the images from the second article. We put this in a loop, put it overnight, and in the morning, we have everything that our daily ever published. It's fantastic, yeah? So you get a kind of, a, I don't know, right? 100, 200, 300,000 images on your computer. And you are, in a way, behaving in a way how these big guys are behaving, who are very comfortable with the internet, like, for instance, Google. So one poem, one evening, 10 years of publishing from our daily. So then you make another poem, another evening, or even the same evening for, for the zine, you have both of them. So that's more than half a million images. So you, you can get really a lot of them. And now, of course, so that's fantastic, yeah, but what do we do with this? So how do we start looking at these images? So in a way, what I think we, we need to, we don't need to, but what, what is uh, uh, interesting is that we can make informational faces out of these clouds. Yeah? We can make an informational face of an image, we can make an informational face of a book, we can make an informational face of a library or a blog or whatever it is that can be found in an environment which is full of information. And to encode, as we said, we don't have the unit or the measure. So we need, in a way, to articulate the unit and the measure. And the measure is a part of the encoding process, which is now very relaxed because there is no right or wrong how we do it. So for instance, if we take this, this image of CCTV and we want, to, we want to make an informational face out of it, we want to encode it in a way. So there, let's put it here like small, two, two, like this. And now we are trying to get the face. 
And for instance, just to show you a few strategies, but I, I'm sure you are already familiar with this. So one strategy is to say, okay, take this image and make it four pixels, just four pixels. And now just give me the red color of the first pixel, the blue color of the first pixel, and the green color of the first pixel. Yeah? So this would be a kind of an encoding in terms of colors. Or we can say, I want to see this image as a, as an edge drawing, an edge detect. And then I want to just check the frequency of white pixels here. Yeah? So the frequency of white pixel in the first square is like this, in the second like this. And already just these two, it's a very powerful description of, or a very pow powerful encoding of an image. Then what Mathematica gives us always is a lot of these kind of built-in functions that we can get certain information that we really don't even have to know what they're about. Yeah? Or we can, we can use uh, the Fourier transform. This is what Ludger likes a lot. Yeah? So then you get the, the complex numbers. Or we can use the image identifier. This is what Alice likes a lot. Yeah? So she wants to look what is, what is on this image. So on this image it's a skyscraper, it's a building, it's a construction, it's an artifact, and it's an office building. And this is the probability of this to be kind of okay. And then to encode an image, so if we want to have it in a, we say okay, yeah, but now I want to have it more precise, I just kind of increase the, increase the resolution of all these kind of different measures, and I get a lot of more, more, uh, more many more numbers, yeah? and I can put them in any way how I like, and I can invent different strategies how to encode this image and put them together however I like and then test if it works or not. So it's a kind of an open game which is beyond subjective and objective. And what is interesting here is that in a way how we encode, so the cryptography, the way how we measure and the way how we mediate and play with this, it's, it's a very delicate way how these things are interwoven. And now we say, okay, and now we want to have the face of the whole block. And in principle, it's very simple. So we just take all the images and do the same kind of strategy on all the images. And if we do that, we get something like this. It's a kind of a table, a matrix, in which we have all the images. And then each row is a description of one image. So it's the green color, the red color, the blue color, the frequency of of uh, pixels, white pixels in the edge detect and so on. And so this is the description of one image and this would be a kind of a spectral view of a specific index of the whole library. So this is the, the, the red pixel of all the images in, in our library. And th this is in a way an informational face of, of, of an image of a blog. And by this we are able to work with this image. So this is how Alice is able then to deal the deal and work with a lot of images without looking at them. So we are suddenly able to play with half a million of images. So this is the way how Alice works with images. This is an informational face of an image. Now Alice works as well a lot with text because she's doing tweets and on these tweets she, she posts images and she talks about these images. So it's a kind of relationship between text and images. So if this is an informational face of an image, what would be an informational face of a book? So when we are working with, with text, so instead of having the pixels and the images and numbers, now we have books, libraries, words and, and numbers. So this is a kind of a format of text that, that we need. So it's a kind of a, a, a text which is online. And then we start kind of counting different things, encoding again instead of an image. Now we are encoding a text. And what is interesting here is that we don't have to categorize in advance this text. So we don't have to say this text is like this, or this text is from biology, this text is from here, this text is from there. No, we can, we can measure different things. So we can, for instance, just count all the words and then look 
At, for instance, the word architecture in the first book appears this many times, in the second like this, in the third like this, and so on. And what, what we get is an interesting situation where, if we look at it like this horizontally, then it shows how the word architecture behaves in our library. If we look at it vertically, we see how the word architecture behaves in the book. Then if we say, okay, but if I change the library, then the behavior of this word will be different. So this is an interesting thing to, to think that the word behaves differently, not just in different books, but in different libraries. So we can encode these things in different ways, or we, instead of only words, we can count the letters, or we can count the, the bigrams, or we can go to the Google rating of a certain book, or to Kindle rating, and we can combine them how, however we like. So it's a, the same strategy as with images. And you've seen with before that in, a, in the same way, way you can treat the movies, and in the same way you can treat, I don't know, music, and so on. So this is an informational phase of a book. And once we have these informational phases of a book, then we can start looking at the, the libraries in different ways. Yeah? For instance, we can have, we can have, a, a, so it's nice that these kind of setups are algebraic, so you can play however you want to render them and however you want to compose with them. So we can make this kind of word cloud. So here we have a library of famous contemporary architects and you can see how some of them are more interested in projects, some are more interested in cities and the urban, some are more interested in houses, in design, some are forensic, and so on. So you get a, some are more in, in terms of images, works, you, you get a kind of a feeling of, of what might be at stake for them. Or we can render them in terms of graphs, so it's a kind of a connectivity of, of different works. And when, once we have the informational phases and the connectivity of, of these elements, then we can start asking different questions to those architects. And this is one, one of the things that Alice, Alice uses a lot in, in the way how she posts on Twitter. So what we have here is, is a library of 100 architects which are super contemporary and important. And we can ask them what they think about the city. So for instance, what is a city? And if we ask these 100 architects, what we get is a kind of a spectrum of what they have to say about architecture, about the city. So, for instance, Rossi said the city is in its history. Aravena says we have seen that the city is a shortcut towards equality. And you can already feel the difference in the temperament, how they are talking. Or this guy says the real time city is real. I don't know who else. These guys say the whole city is asphalt and concrete. Eisenman says for Rossi the city is a theater of human events. And then Kolhas says a lot of things about his way of looking at the city as a kind of a generic city. So what we, what we get is a spectrum, but in this spectrum of course none of the architects are aware that they are being asked questions, so it's completely out of context. The, the sentences are out of context, yeah? But the beauty is that you get a spectrum which makes a new context for all of them. And out of this context, they're all talking about what the city might be. So this is what, what Alice uses a lot when she works with, uh, with text. And of course now you can ask, okay, but uh, uh, where do this, all of these books come from? Again, they come from different places. So, for instance, one of the libraries is this library, Genesis. So this is a kind of a pirate library where you can find more than two million different books. If you don't like the pirates so much, you can go to Gutenberg and then you have it all super legal free. If you're not satisfied with this, you can invest, you can buy from Kindle. Or what we did, like here, together with, with you, with the help of, of students of ETH, is a kind of a personal 
library or a personal Xenoteca of an architectural student at ETH. What we get here is like 300, or I mean it will grow, more than 300 books, which are just one click away. So I think it's, it's fantastic the first day you come to, to, to the university that you get 300 books on architecture. And when Martin Delbecke starts talking about Vitruvius, you go directly open the book and see Vitruvius firsthand. I think this is super fantastic. And then later you learn how to work with Vitruvius in the context of other hundred books, or in the context of blogs, or put him together with movies, with images, and, and so on. What is interesting when we are dealing with this kind of informational objects is that there is a kind of a circular relation between the instruments that we use to encode them and between the libraries that these informational objects, in this case books, inhabit. So kind of an informational face of a book is constituted by this circular relation of those two. And if we change the library, or if we change the way of looking at the library, the books start to behave in a different way. So I think this is a very interesting, especially if we, if we think how we perceive the book. So always when we, we read a book, what this book is to us is always a kind of a reflection on all the books that we have ever read, and it kind of gives another layer on top of them. So with the new book which we've read, all the books that we read before change a little bit, and these books, this, the new book gets a, a kind of an atmosphere of the books that we already read. So th this is a kind of, it's not a direct analogy, but it's an interesting way to think how a book in informational space behaves in, in this kind of an environment. And here, we cannot say that this is a kind of poetic way or it's a kind of a practical way, but it's beyond practical and poetic. So it's a kind of an exchange in between these two manners of, of working with, with objects, with lists, with books. And now we start articulating. Yeah? So we have, we have seen how we can encode different elements. Now let's try to, to, to start articulating. Let's see how Alice can work with these things. And what is happening in our play, in our articulation, is that objects in the distance, they change their skins and they send one another kisses. So it's a kind of a, a metaphor, but I think it's a very beautiful metaphor which works in a very beautiful way with what's going on. So if, if we have, so this is an algorithm, a kind of a machine intelligence algorithm, which is trying to give informational faces to books and to libraries. So here we see how a book is getting an ex expression, a facial expression in, in a kind of a drama which is happening in relation to all the other books. So this is something that defines this book and this is something that articulates this book in the context of, in the context of all of the other books. And these things behind, they are a kind of, they are the indexes. So in this case, they were words. And now if you look at the library that Alice is working with, each of those squares is one book. And each of these highlights represents what makes this book special in the context of the library. The interesting thing is if we add another book or if we remove a book, all this environment, all these different atmospheres will change slightly. And now if, if, if we, we want to go a little bit more closer to start thinking what this might be, what this might be about. So if we take a zoom at two, at two different books, like for instance Alberti and Calvino, what we can see is that they have highlights at the, at the similar position. So now I start again with storytelling. So how to, how to think about these things. So there are these kind of abstract concepts around, but we need a way how to think about them. So we can in a way say that these books, since they care about the same kind of concepts, that they are in love. Huh? 
So I think that's a kind of an interesting way to put it. Of course, this is not true, but it's a kind of an interpretation. And if we keep interpreting this in different ways, then we get a different notion. So for instance, if we have Zizek and the Holy Bible, what we can see is that the, the way how they express their faces is by stressing the concepts which are kind of in diametrically opposite. So then, of course, if we play this kind of funny game, we can say that they hate each other. But of course, it's not Zizek and it's not the Holy Bible, but it's this text in a specific library under specific encoding that they show their temperament in this way. So it's very important that we are aware of that. Or if we have a more complicated setup with the postmodern condition and the beyond good and evil, what we have is that each one is coming from, uh, from another side. So we could kind of dramatize this in a way that it's a kind of a flirting setup between those two books. Now, what is common to all of those books is the library. Yeah? The library is a kind of a commonality of the books. And if we remove the, the highlights, this kind of blue and, and yellow color, what is left in the background is something which I call the galaxy of concepts. So it's a kind of a galaxy, and these are concepts. Or I call them as well atom letters. So because they, they have both the, the, the number and the letter inside. They have a kind of a quality and a quantity inside of themselves. And this is then with the color reflects how each of the books sees the library. And since Alice, of course, wants to treat, what she's interested in is our images and books. So let's try to see what's going with images and books or images and texts here. So if we try to search for an image in this constellation of concepts, we can say this is one concept or this is one atom letter. This atom letter is indexed by an image. This is what, what Alice is interested in. And this image, to kind of get a feeling what this image might be about, we need to look a little bit around. So it's image, it's imagination, it's the memory, the immemorial, it's the Greek, and the poet, and the poem, and Rilke, and poetic, and a shell, and a fragment, and a surface. So you get the feeling that this image is an image in a poetic context, what, whatever this means. Huh? But you get a very subtle, subtle context for what the image might be. So if we go further and now we search for text, this is the other topic which Alice likes. Yeah? So text is here. Now this text is in the context of the signify, metaphor, language, sign, origin, trace, criticize, signification, deconstruction, linguistics, mathematics, synthetic, peers, and so on. So this text is, let's say, in a linguistic context. So what is, I, I find, what I find striking and very, very beautiful is that we get an image and we have a text and then we get these super subtle clouds around them. Yeah? So image in a poetic context and text in a linguistic context. Of course, it's again a dramatization, but we never had to specify for any of those books if they are, I don't know, biology books or physics books or if they are about this topic or if they are about that topic. No, we, we played with them on the level of the library and we played with them on the level of different kind of encoding. I think it's fantastic to get this kind of, uh, uh, these kind of differences. And of course now we want to see, okay, which books are the ones that are interested in those concepts? Because this is what Alice cares about. So Alice is partially me as well, keep, keep that in mind. Yeah? So we try to find the, the books which have a kind of a highlight or an intensity on the, on the same place. And this is a place where in, where in this kind of uh, uh, galaxy of atom letters, in this galaxy of atom letters, these elements are. 
I have one thought that I cannot remember. Okay, but what is interesting here is that they have this highlight at the, at the same place. Yeah? Now we have these different protagonists. So one is Blanchot, the book to come. Another one is Cash, Earth, Moves. Bachelard, the poetics of space, they lose the difference and repetition. So in a way, all of them, in different ways, they refer to, to those concepts. This is what, what, we, what we care for at the moment. Yeah? Text and images and which books are interested in, in these things. So now we want to ask not the concepts to move around, but we would like to ask the books to form a, a kind of a, a library and somehow that the books that like each other go to, to a similar shelf, let's say. And then in this shelf we want to search where are the books that are around text and images. So if we look at this library, which has only 12 shelves, and we try to find where are the, the books that we just discussed, so here is Bernard Cash, and then here is one Deleuze, here is another Deleuze, here is Blanchot, a book to come, so we can say that this kind of area could be around those, those concepts. What is beautiful with, with this kind of playing with books or with this way of organizing library, that this is not the library that organizes books by topics or that wants to have books under discipline, yeah? kind of disciplined books. So this is one discipline, this is another discipline, this is another discipline, and then you sort these books. No, this is a library in which these books start to tell more about themselves and start to show their faces in different ways by going to, to, to different shelves. And now if you look at the books here on the left, we can see how their character is different than the ones here. So here we have like Swift, Stein, we have Cervantes, Don Quixote, we have Asimov, the robot, and so on. So this would be a kind of a radically different atmosphere than this one. So let's take an arbitrary division and divide this library in three characters. And let's say that this third character is Alice. Because in, in, in those shelves are the books that are concerned with text and images. And now we will take a library from internet, some a lot of books that we don't have a clue what they are about, that we've never read and that we've never seen, and there is a lot of them, and we will try to to, to like throw each of those books and see into which character it goes. So which character would accommodate and take this book as a kind of a guest. And when we do this, okay, so in this case it was around 300 books, so the character 1 has 99 guests, character 2 has 88 guests, and our Alice has 81 guests. After Alice welcomes her guests, this means that these books entered her library, then all the concepts have to be rearranged in a way, so that these guests are not guests anymore, but they become friends, and what we get is what I call it, the character of Alice. So this would be a body of Alice, and this body consists out of these 81 books. This would be like the most prominent concepts that Alice likes to work with. If we want to, to say, okay, but Alice, of course, She's a complicated character, so she has kind of different kind of tempers. So let's try to see four of those tempers. So this would be four of Alice's tempers. And if we want to see them in terms of what each temper is about, one of the tempers is about the design, one is about film, images and fashion, one is about the digital image, the new technology, one is about, let's say, contemplation and yoga. So Alice is a kind of this kind of new age digital humanist. Again, a kind of a dramatization of what she might be. So a kind of someone who, I would say someone who wants to be cool in a way, huh? this kind of profile she has. If we want to look at Alice on the level of atom letters and concepts, this would be her galaxy of concepts. And this would be the way how Alice is able to light up the galaxy of concepts. 
So this would be, in a way, we can call it like a brain of Alice in terms of texts. So each, each of those, this is, each one of these is a book, and each of those books gives a certain temperament to, to this galaxy of concepts. So this would be a kind of a brain of Alice. So if this is a brain of Alice in terms of looking at the, looking at the images, now, of course, the next question is, what is, the, what is the brain of Alice if she is looking at images? Now I just have to figure out right here. So if Alice starts to play with, with images, So this is a kind of a, a mutant or a better. This is not directly the brain of Alice, but the characters and the atmosphere that Alice likes are a part of this atmosphere, of this weather. And at the moment, this is a mutant of Art Daily and the Zine. So this is everything that Art Daily and the Zine ever published in a kind of a better or atmospheric map. So it's a kind of a face, a rendering of 10 years of architecture. And again, the, the beautiful thing is that the, these different consistencies or different resolutions of what this mutant might be is completely up to us. Yeah? So how do we render it? And then, of course, if we don't like it like this, we can say, I want to have only art daily or only design. So in this case, I said, I want to have only our daily. So I render it in a more in a more fancy way. So this is a kind of a brain of our daily. Yeah, and you can see it has a lot of of different stuff. And you and you can see how this somehow grouped together. Yeah? Again, we didn't impose Category is predefined, but we have a, a kind of a, a, an encoding and we have a kind of a library from which the consistency comes out. And now the, the question is, so what is, inter what is another interesting here, thing here is that each of those images here is a character, so it's not an image. So each one is a character and in itself it has a lot. So there is a kind of a verticality to, to, to this image. So let's try to go in depth into those characters and explore, and explore what they are about. So it's a kind of a quest for, for flavors. So let's try to explore these characters and then see if we can use these characters as a way to articulate taste for Alice. So here each of these images is one character. And you can see how in principle they are all consistent in themselves, almost consistent as a kind of a good Instagram or a good Twitter, good Twitter account. And we never specified what is a building, we never specified what is a watch, we never specified what is an atmosphere, we never specified what is a pattern, and all these kind of things, they come out. And there are other things which, in principle, we don't even know how to specify them or to say what they are, but they, they give us a kind of an atmos atmosphere or a kind of a, a kind of a flavor. And now how can we play with this to, to use this as characters to articulate a taste how Alice feels about images. So again, it's stunningly simple. So this is a, a, a lower resolution of the cloud of our daily and the zine, and we just need to say what Alice likes and what Alice doesn't like. Yeah? It's that simple. So we say, okay, Alice likes this. These are kind of, let's say, patterns. She likes these kind of drawings. She likes a little bit of these houses in the green. And she likes this, 
and this and this and we don't even have to say what this is yeah so we just say this is what Alice likes and it's again very similar like with books now we just take images and we throw them and it's a kind of a filter if, if an image goes through these holes this is what Alice likes and if it goes into the pink part Alice doesn't like it so what Alice likes is a kind of a cocktail of patterns, drawings, horizontal buildings with a little bit of green garnish. And now if we want to explicate this, so this would be an explication of if that was the brain of Alice in terms of text, this would be a kind of a brain of Alice in terms of images. This is what constitutes Alice at the moment. Of course, we can make a lot of these different maps and Alice can have different characters or we can make different characters and avatars. And now the last challenge is how do we try to combine this, these notions in the character in the character of Alice. Oops. So if we had Alice on the level of images and if this is a kind of her character, which was in a way articulated out of 13,000 books that we've never read or seen, and if this is a brain of Alice or the way how she likes images, which is articulated out of half a million of images that again we haven't seen, now we want to bring them together. And then the hypothesis is that even though these two don't, are not directly related, so they are independent data sets. If, if we unfold them, kind of, if, 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 we, if we give them space and time to unfold and make a relationship between them, there will be a kind of consistency in between. And this is what, what Alice is about. So for instance, this is another poem. This is a poem that makes for Alice, a relationship be between the text and the images. So just to, to give a hint how this might work. So Alice looks at this image. She throws it on her brain. She says, okay, I like it. She likes it and then she wants to, with this probability encoded that, encoding that we had in the beginning, she tries to say what is on this image. So it's scuba, ventilator, device, instrumentation, artifact, and so on. And then she asks her library to comment on, on this. Yeah? And then this together makes a tweet. Tweet with an image, with the hashtags, and with the comments. And now if we go on Twitter, here is Alice. She did 600 tweets, follows 480 people, followed by 190 people. And these are her, her different tweets. Yeah, so she takes this, for instance, and then she tries to identify what is here, and then she gives a kind of a comment. In other words, if the visual economy of text messages pins down the message trapping it within a text image, then sending a message may reopen the circular on unravel a calligram somewhat. Yeah, so does it make sense or not? It's a question, but then what's interesting is if you start looking at more and more of these tweets, it starts to make sense. Huh? And then she looks at this and she says, okay, and on the ground, workers pushing hand cards filled with stone and aggregate. So sometimes she makes kind of ironic. So or here, huh? if she looks at this and she says, okay, it's a basketball, it's a maple, it's shopping cart. It's a person and she says, okay, in my studies, this will mean in practice that I'm only going to analyze shopping centers that I know personally. So she starts commenting on, on, on these things. And not just that. So what she can do as well, and this is also, I think, kind of cool, is that she looks around what other people are tweeting and she checks if she likes it. And then if she likes it, she retweets these other tweets. So, for instance, this is about science fiction movies. And then she, she tweets, she continues to tweet tweets again. Yeah? So, she sees this and she says, okay, his parents 
gave him a patch of the family garden where he could nurture and grow things. Yeah. So I think it's a kind of a funny, funny setup to see. And I think what is kind of interesting to, to keep in mind is that so this kind of artificial intelligence, so it, it's tricky to say what this is, yeah? So it's a kind of autonomous, but it's not autonomous. It's me, but it's not me. So it's a, in a kind of a funny, funny setup. Yeah. Of course, I know the question is, why is this not on Instagram? So the, this is also a very funny thing, is that uh, different social media have different policies and they just don't accept Alice. Yeah? So Instagram doesn't like creatures like Alice. Instagram says it's only for humans. So it's kind of strong discrimination towards all this. Twitter, on the other hand, is very open and it likes all these different creatures to, to be there. Okay, so I think that's, that's the story of, of Alice. Yeah, thank you and if you want to comment, please. Of course, I mean, not mine, yeah, but there are many. It's because Twitter is very open to, to these kind of things. So they have, they have a certain policy how these bots should behave. So if they do too many of certain things, then they kind of ban them. But in principle, it's open. And what is nice with... Uh, uh, what is nice with, with Mathematica, so this is super cool, is that Mathematica has a direct you can post directly from Mathematica. So I want to show you how it looks like. Ah, this is my computer at home. And this is Alice. Alice posting, yeah. So she's at home, she looks at it. She says, okay, no, ret no retreat, didn't post. She posts, she looks at different stuff. And it's, it's not too sophisticated because my computer has to run all the time but I didn't want to do it sophisticated, I was just kind of eager to make it run. And it's, yeah, this is the, the code and you just say, okay, post, tweet, and you have these commands and it's very simple how to, how to organize this. Of course, the, the preparation work is a little bit more difficult, but to make it tweet, it's super easy. So what's, uh, what's, of course, yeah? this, what, this is what happened with Instagram. So one year ago they were open to these things and then they said they shut it down. But I think with Twitter they really kind of cherish this, that you have all these different bots that then they can analyze uh, uh, news and then they use it for, for different things. Yeah? So they kind of like it. I think this is a part of their profile that they are open to these kind of creatures, but they have policies. So for instance, you cannot tweet more than 2000 tweets per day. Or if you make more than 500 friends a day, they kick you out. Or if these bots start to comment on people, they kick you out as well. So there are certain norms. And also when crawling these things, you, there are certain norms that they get. But they are open to, to this. <laughs> I never thought about this before because I wanted to do it on Instagram. Because here in our kind of community here, everyone is with Instagram, no one is with Twitter. But it didn't work out.
Yeah, with, uh, with Dark Daily, this was so funny. So I did all of this with Dark Daily and the zine, and I made a nice story, I made nice kind of images, and then I sent an email to both Dark Daily and to the zine, and I told them, oh, look guys, what I did, I think this is very interesting, put it on your website, publish it. And then the guys from the zine, they didn't even uh, kind of look, but from Dark Daily, I got a response from the head guy, yeah? so from this main guy of Dark Daily, he wrote an email and then we were exchanging two or three emails and then he just kind of ignored it. But in the beginning he was super kind of enthusiastic, how do you do it? Da, 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 da. I told him, ah, this is how I do it. And then we kind of exchanged a few emails and I told him, if you're in Zurich, come, I can show you these things. So I don't know if they find this kind of stupid or if they are afraid of these kind of things. I mean, it's cool, man. you go there, take everything, you don't have to ask anyone anything. <laughs> and then you show them and of course they are a little bit stressed. Like, what is this? And the, the thing why they won't close it is because they like to be searched. So all of these websites, they, they are actually doing the websites in a way that they are as searchable as possible. They want Google to kind of rank them, characterize them, to put them in their database uh, the best, in the best way. Huh? So they even put more tags to be found faster. That's the nice thing. So they like to be searched. <laughs>